I'm going to click this. We're going live. And all right, it looks like that's going. Great. So let's switch over. Want me to test my screen share? Um, sure. I mean, okay. it should work. I've given you co-host, so. Um, let me try it this way. What do you see on your screen? It says, yes, there we are. So I've got it. OK. Now I'm going to stop my screen share then. All right. Great. Well, go ahead. Um, we are live. So um, if you want to, I mean, you've been on here a few times, so I don't know if you need to do a thorough introduction. Sure, I'll, I'll do a quick yeah, sure. one. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Chris for giving me a chance to uh, present today. Um, uh, we, we had had some back and forth and he had asked me some questions and I said, well, you know, I don't think you're giving me a chance to uh, argue uh, really my best case. And it's not really fair to my co-authors who've worked on our ideas for a while. And uh, I said, it's fine to disparage or question or criticize that. It's just that I felt that uh, um, it'd be better. It'd be just more sporting to, to let me articulate my case and, and, and then you know, I felt he was grilling me and he's, I said, I think I should have the same opportunity. And that's fair for, I think it's, it's healthy to be skeptical, highly critical, demand answers and point out what you think are problems. And that's, I, I said, that's, he's welcome to do that. But if we're going to, if I'm going to be on a show, um, you know, I felt I'd like at least the chance to, to articulate the case the way I think it should be articulated. And then he can, he can blast away at it. So, um, so I'm an independent molecular biophysics researcher. Uh, this happened because I was an aerospace engineer and um, I had to take care of my mom during her 18 years that she was widowed. And so I, I happened to get a job working from home for Dr. John Sanford, who was an atheist turned Christian turned creationist and that kind of how that's kind of how I got really deep into creationism. And so I'm going to be articulating some of the uh, some of our works that are critical of evolutionary theory. And we're going to go mostly through uh, kind of the secular peer review papers of how we made our case. So that's me. And if you'd like to introduce yourself while I. Yeah, sure. So, right. I mean, the, if everyone's here, they're, they're familiar with my channel. Um, so I'm a professor of neuroscience at Virginia Tech. And uh, but I have a keen interest in evolution and evolution creation debate is something that's kind of a fun hobby for me. And um, I've uh, been interested in this topic for some time. So and I'm starting to get back into it a little bit more, paying attention to it more. Okay, so I'll just, uh, this presentation I'm going to make was one, I, I did like a blast, I mean, just a really fast version of it in my last debate. Um, short debate formats are not, uh, it, it's hard to, to cram things in. So some of you have watched that. This will be a little bit lengthier, um, hopefully better paced. So I'll go for 20 minutes about for the presentation. I'll show some videos and I might, and I plan to ask Dr. Chris some tough questions for the next 20. And then he's, uh, he graciously invited me to do that. And um, he can grill me for the rest of the 40 minutes or whatever and present uh, and criticize and that's fine. So oh, uh, I'm gonna start now and uh, let me share my screen. The great tragedy of science is the uh, is the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. I believe evolutionary theory has lots, uh, as it's stated now, uh, it is uh, being slayed by many ugly facts. The uh, short debate formats. This is not really a debate, but I'm just it's not really good for technical topics. There are things like uh, Brandolini's law, which inhibits discovery of truth. And 200-hour uh, long debate formats are better for really technical, I mean, technical, hard, scientific, if you want to get into everything deeply, um, that would be better. Um, this, I really believe this was born out in the exchange between James Tour and Dave Farina. Uh, Dave Farina made a 20-minute video, and then James Tour, who's a world-famous chemist, the protege of a Nobel Prize winner, Richard Smalley, who happens to be a creationist, um, did a rebuttal of 10 hours and it's still been going back and forth. That's been a very celebrated exchange, at least by creationists. Uh, 
uh, he criticized the origin of life problem uh, and also uh, the way it's progressing in the mainstream. And I think what's indicative of the problem of naturalism as far as trying uh, to be an explanation is the fact people as senior as Eugene Kunin are now appealing to multiple universes and <laughs> publishing peer-reviewed articles to that effect that uh, multiple universes are needed to overcome the improbabilities in the origin of life. That's not specifically evolution, but I'm pointing out where things are headed. And then also uh, an, another researcher, uh, Totani, same thing. There are uh, a mainstream, respected mainstream researcher is complaining a lot of the origin of life experiments are prob are not so much fr fraudulent, but uh, they they are uh, they are misleading and they're overinflated in their claims. Too much human intervention. These are not these are not representative of what happens naturally. In his abstract, he used the word "hand of God" dilemma, and uh, it's kind of funny he uses that word. You kind of need like the hand of God to make things work. So really, now if we go to evolution, which is different than abiogenesis. Um, I feel Dr. Michael Behe has articulated the case that uh, evolution actually is a de-evolutionary process, the loss of function. And, and so he wrote the book, Darwin Devolves. Uh, we had kind of an, a hint of this in, uh, there's a Wikipedia entry uh, article called Spiegelman's Monster, where it talks about an RNA chain that is replicated. Uh, it's only 218 nucleotides. Now, now it's not really a full uh, cellular replicator, they used this RNA replicase. But the thing that is, uh, should be portends of trouble is that the, the strand actually, the replicator started out at 4,500 bases, and then it reduced to 218. This was hailed as, as an example of uh, natural selection. But if, if that's the case, this is not really good because it, it's actually kind of a reductive evolution, a reduction of gene size. So uh, that didn't portend well, and that was only 1965. Uh, since then, in 2007, B, he actually just surveyed. He got this in secular peer-reviewed uh, journal, uh, the, um, the, uh, the Quarterly Review of Biology, and this is a respected publisher in University of Chicago, 2007, reviewed and said, uh, concluded most experiments and observations of actual direct um, uh, evolution, uh, you know, not imagined or inferred, has been reductive or however you want to call it, loss of function. And that has been since confirmed by Lenski. The... Uh, Underlined here, genomes decay despite sustained fitness gains. This means natural selection decays the genome. It does not construct. It does not add. Uh, you know, I mean, whether we can generalize this, but this is, we're getting more and more of this, and this is not the following title. Yeah, Lenski was the one who ran it, long-term evolution experiment. And then to see titles like this, again, by Kunin, one of the most senior evolutionary biologists, and Wolf being the lead author, genome reduction as the dominant mode of evolution. Uh, so you, we, you know, it, uh, he, he says that we have this dominant mode where um, genes are being lost and there's reduction, and then we have this unexplained explosion. And I said, this does not bode well for naturalistic evolution certainly not Darwinian evolution, and Behe has continued to be vindicated. There, uh, I argue for creationism, which I believe is, strictly speaking, outside of science as an explanation, but it doesn't mean it's untrue. I think maybe the explanation's outside of science. Uh, there are two varieties, two, you know, kind of two varieties of creationism. Old Earth creationism, which was uh, something that was accepted by Nobel Prize winner in uh, chemistry, Richard Smalley, who was uh, who had been uh, uh, the mentor of James Tour, and then young earth creationism, mainstream scientists like John Gideon Hartnett, uh, associate professor down there in Australia in physics, and then John C. Sanford, research professor at Cornell, retired, uh, world-famous genetic engineer. So I... <clears throat> 
If we go to young earth creationism, I, I'd say that, uh, you know, the bent pencils and optical illusion explained by Snell's laws of physics. If the fossil record is young, um, we have to, you know, the young earth creationists need physics and chemistry to show that uh, the appearance of age is, 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 is an allegorically, metaphorically, uh, an illusion. So uh, what was my work? It was, um, it was kind of tracking the ENCODE project and also helping with population genetics analysis. <clears throat> it stems from this statement by Dan Grauer, who's an evolutionary biologist. He said, if ENCODE is right, then evolution is wrong. That was in 2013 when ENCODE said most of the genome is functional. <clears throat> And uh, I, I agree, and so do the Young Earth creationists, and it looks looking like ENCODE is right. Um, Grower has had to kind of backpedal now because it's looking strong that ENCODE is right. Uh, well, that remains to be seen how right they are, but then uh, he's kind of eating his words at this point that evolution is wrong. So the, where Grower got that idea was from uh, the work it began by the work of Herman, uh, Herman Mueller in 1946. He won the Nobel Prize, but it's really his 1950s paper, Our Load of Mutations. And it was elaborated on better, a little more clearly, indirectly, not directly, by this paper by uh, Kimura and Mayurama. And this equation in red is really basically the Poisson distribution. This is well known, but uh, Kimura was able to to kind of use it for those familiar with population genetics. I had gone uh, analyzed that and kind of worked through the numbers because I'd seen this in the literature. If anyone wants to really talk about it, we can walk through it. I'm gonna um, show kind of the more simple version of this. It was talked about in the paper, I'm mean, sorry, a uh, reference chapter that is probably on many, it's, it's on many university library shelves uh, it's the Handbook of Mathematics and the Arts and Sciences. I co-authored a chapter that's there. You can buy it from Springer Direct for $1,500. It used to be available at Walmart for $819. But basically, the problem is Darwinian selection is the idea that uh, the, the green here are healthy. These are uh, these are uh, individuals with a mutation. It doesn't matter the degree. The idea is natural selection is going to eliminate it. And so we have, uh, I represent natural selection by Arnold Schwarzenegger. He says, hasta la vista, baby. And you eliminate the individual with the bad mutation. Sayonara, muchacho. And superficially, this, uh, if we use Darwin's words that, you know, natural selections daily, uh, removing the bad and keeping the good, uh, that's kind of the, the idea. So it looks like selection works. The problem is, what if the each individual has a at least one defect? Doesn't matter how you know. Let's say that most mutations are bad, and then in a situation where each individual has at least one defect, and Mueller was the one who started to consider what would happen in that scenario, and that was in his paper. And then that's what the math is about. But this is kind of the simplified version. Uh, you know, all the corner cases and recombination are considered. That's why you need the Poisson distribution. So the problem is you can't eliminate everything. And hence, the deterioration's irreversible. And that's why it, there's a point when the mutation rate is too high for uh, uh, selection to, to work uh, and prevent genomic decay. There had been suggested, to be fair, rescue mechanisms uh, like soft selection, synergistic epistasis, which are very speculative, and there are also mathematical problems in the way it's defined. Uh, and this is really borne out by experiments here. Again, Lenski, genomes decay despite sustained fitness gains in bacteria. So if ENCODE is right, then evolution is wrong. Uh, just, just showing this again. So here's an example where natural selection all, actually also uh, where uh, quote unquote beneficial mutations actually uh, don't work the way we'd like. So intelligence and childlessness, uh, intelligence is actually uh, considered maladaptive if we're evolutionary biologists because highly intelligent women 
25% uh, don't have kids at all. So, so the, the IQ is going down and that is uh, we're monitoring that the way that we can measure that more, uh, you know, uh, in less controversial manner than IQ tests is we can measure nerve speed. It's highly correlated or it's reasonably correlated with nerve speed. And uh, the, the bottom line is we can actually test this hypothesis if the human genome is deteriorating. So uh, this uh, these considerations led uh, uh, creationists like John Sanford to publish a book, The Mystery of the Genome, um, predicting that um, our genome is going to deteriorate. There's nothing we can do about it. Uh, and and um, he also concluded this would imply that uh, evolution could not have been right, at least naturalistic evolution. Uh, th there would have to have been miracles along the way. Uh, the timing of this is, you know, you can't, I don't think it can really be used as an argument for, for saying, you know, how, how young humanity is, except to say, you know, say it, it, the ancestral line could not have been millions of years old without a miracle. And, um, you know, uh, the secular side is, I, I work for someone who is, you know, involved in this idea of a lot of genomic engineering to kind of rescue the genome. So it's, uh, there's no, there's no major geneticist following, um, you know, the progress of the human genome that thinks we're improving. All of them are very concerned for our health. And uh, they may have different explanations as to why our genome's deteriorating. I, I'd say that it's not just modern medicine. This trend has been there for a long time, and it looks like it's going to be um, inevitable. So uh, basically, I think Dawkins' blind watchmaker is really, uh, it, it's, it's in the dumpster at this point. There's this third way of evolution, and, you know, it's, this is not... This is no longer really regarded very highly. Uh, I, I was in a debate with um, Dr. Chris, and I pointed out uh, that proteins slash genes do not have a universal common ancestor. And that really, I, <laughs> it's misunderstood what I was trying to say. I said, no one is disagreeing with that. I was just merely pointing that out. And and Aaron Raw was like, uh, don't you realize that proteins don't have a common ancestor? It's like, no, I'm the one who put that on the table because everyone agrees with it. That's not the problem. Uh, the problem is that um, the proteins, because they have no common ancestors, there's not a gradual route from a single common ancestor. It'd be easier if we could model the evolution of proteins like we model the evolution of uh, like we model or claim the evolution from a single common ancestor that diversified. That would make it easier. It makes it harder when proteins have independent ancestry because where did the proteins of major complexity come from? Some of these need all the parts, not all. It needs so many of the parts simultaneously to be viable. Otherwise, it's not any good. And that's the real problem here because we have proteins um, like the topoisomerase and potassium ion channel. So potassium ion channel is something that is, um, let me stop sharing my screen. Uh, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna share another, I'm gonna share a video here if you'll indulge me and it'll be the potassium ion channel. I think it, it'd be it'd be useful to show um, and I have it here and then I'm gonna okay. ask Dr. Chris after I show I'm sorry. No, it's fine. Go ahead. Okay, let me try to bring that up. You shouldn't be able to share whatever. Uh, I don't know if I, I don't know how I, how I possibly lost it. Now I feel really bad. Uh, let me see. Okay. Is it back Okay, so I'm going to share it, and then I'm going to share the translocation, and I'm going to ask. Uh, after I show, we'll just we'll just talk about it a little bit, and I'll I'll just say that you know to me, this is just too hard to believe this can evolve naturally. So let me. Um, I'm going to share the sound. And, oh, 
okay. I'll play it. The bacterial potassium channel is a multi-pass transmembrane protein in the plasma membrane. It is built from four identical subunits that are arranged symmetrically. A pore in the center of the protein allows selective passage of potassium ions across the membrane. Four rigid protein loops, one contributed by each subunit, form a selectivity filter at the narrowest part of the pore. This structure is responsible for the channel's high degree of selectivity for potassium ions over sodium ions. In this selectivity filter, carbonyl groups line the walls of the pore. These carbonyl groups are spaced precisely to interact with an unsolvated potassium ion, balancing the energy required to remove its hydration shell. Passage of a sodium ion through the channel is energetically unfavorable because the sodium is too small for optimal interaction with the carbonyl groups. So that was the potassium ion channel, but I'll show one of the other complications and we can discuss this uh, in the 20 minutes or yeah. so if I, if I go a little bit over. The uh, problem I'm having here is this, this is, this is um, uh, thank you for making me a co-host as uh, sure. generous of you, but yeah. Zoom is a little bit unwieldy compared to I'm using other software. So I have to kind of oh, unlearn. Okay. That's so uh, I'm going to show one of the problems with um, protein translocation. I'm going to show a video that this would have, this would be a problem that would have, um, this would, uh, there are membranes, uh, there are membranes in cells, uh, all cells, and then in eukaryotes, we have membrane bound organelles. The problem of inserting a potassium ion channel, uh, it would have analogous problems that you would see in insertion of transmembrane proteins and any other things like the endoplasmic reticulum. The reason I'm showing the endoplasmic reticulum one is because it actually has the best graphics and mm -hmm. conceptually the problem of insertion. So just imagine that this is 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 put, um, the problem of inserting a potassium ion channel would have very many of the same problems, creating a potassium ion channel and then inserting it in the transmembrane. This is what would have to evolve naturally. So I'm going to try to show that. Uh, let me now share my screen again. And thank you for your forbearance. The endoplasmic reticulum, or ER, is the most extensive membrane system in eukaryotic cells. Proteins transported to the Golgi apparatus, endosomes, lysosomes, and the cell surface all must first enter the ER from the cytosol. As an mRNA molecule is translated into a protein, many ribosomes bind to it, forming a polyribosome. There are two separate populations of polyribosomes in the cytosol that share the same pool of ribosomal subunits. Free ribosomes are unattached to any membrane. Membrane-bound ribosomes become riveted to the ER membrane and translate proteins that are translocated into the ER. These membrane-bound ribosomes coat the surface of the ER, creating regions called rough endoplasmic reticulum. Two kinds of proteins are moved from the cytosol to the ER. Water-soluble proteins completely cross the ER membrane and are released into the lumen, while transmembrane proteins only partially cross the ER and become embedded in the membrane. All these proteins are directed to the ER by a signal sequence of small hydrophobic amino acids. The signal sequence is guided to the ER membrane with a signal recognition particle, or SRP, which binds the ER signal sequence in the new protein as it emerges from the ribosome. Protein synthesis then slows down until the SRP ribosome complex binds to an SRP receptor in the ER membrane. The SRP is then released 
passing the ribosome to a protein translocation channel in the ER membrane. Thus, the SRP and SRP receptor function as molecular matchmakers, connecting ribosomes that are synthesizing proteins containing ER signal sequences to available ER translocation channels. In addition to directing proteins to the ER, the signal sequence functions to open the translocation channel. The signal peptide remains bound to the channel, while the rest of the protein chain is threaded through the membrane as a large loop. Once the protein has passed through the membrane, it is released into the ER lumen. After the signal sequence has been cleaved off by a signal peptidase located on the luminal side of the ER membrane. The signal peptide is then released from the translocation channel into the membrane and rapidly degraded. It is thought that a protein serving as a plug then binds from the ER lumen to close the inactive channel. But not all proteins that enter the ER are released into the ER lumen. Some remain embedded in the ER membrane as transmembrane proteins. For clarity's sake, the membrane-bound ribosome will be omitted to illustrate the translocation of transmembrane proteins into the ER membrane. In the simplest case, that of a transmembrane protein with a single membrane-spanning segment, the N-terminal signal sequence initiates translocation, just as for a soluble protein. But the transfer process is halted by an additional sequence of hydrophobic amino acids, a stop transfer sequence, further in the polypeptide chain. The stop transfer sequence is released laterally from the translocation channel and drifts into the plane of the lipid bilayer, where it forms a membrane-spanning segment that anchors the protein in the membrane. As a result, the translocated protein ends up as a transmembrane protein inserted in the membrane with a defined orientation. In some transmembrane proteins, an internal signal sequence is used to start the protein transfer, which continues until a stop transfer sequence is reached. The two hydrophobic sequences are then released into the bilayer where they remain anchored. In complex multipass proteins, in which many hydrophobic regions span the bilayer, additional pairs of stop and start sequences come into play. One sequence reinitiates translocation further down the polypeptide chain, and the other stops translocation and causes polypeptide release and so on for subsequent starts and stops. Thus, multipass membrane proteins are stitched into the lipid bilayer as they are being synthesized by a mechanism resembling a sewing machine. Uh, Dr. Chris, I don't, I'm having a little bit of problem getting, uh, okay. Uh, okay. I got this top share. Sorry. So, um, I have about 15 minutes of questions and then we we'll go to your segment where you can sure. me. So thank you very much for watching that. Um, uh, what I had done, you know, we had the debate where Cindy Lincoln was participating. I was showing her kind of the new set of arguments that I think would be compelling. Uh, many people thought that once she had been separated from her ex-husband, Kent Hoven and Dinosaur Adventureland, that she would abandon creationism. And uh, I came, you know, I, I, I didn't like what happened to her. I felt it was a blight on creationism, what Kent Hoven did. And just we just built a friendship that way. The videos that I had shown and kind of the arguments that you, you just saw are what I've been showing Cindy. And I, I was saying, you know, Aaron, if you want to try to flip, you're going to have to try to engage these arguments uh, head on. I mean, you know, there are people on my side of the table that are not Kent Hoven. They are professors at secular universities. Uh, they are respected. They would be on my side in saying this is, you know, at the very least, evolutionary theory is not is not handling this well. Neither is the, you know, if we want to save some of this is origin of life, it's not handling it well. And I said, you know, to be fair, uh, you know, Aaron's uh, Aaron in our emails is calling me a liar and all sorts of things and stupid. I said, that's that's irrelevant, Cindy. You know, they're going to have to explain this to you and walk you through it. Uh, looking at taxonomic and morphological arguments, it's just kind of looking at the evolution of a car. And you just look at the shapes going from like the three wheeled of uh, Daimler Benz going to four. And then you just kind of look at kind of the skeletal shapes. It's like, well, you know, the modern car has has um, has uh, GPS, 
VLSI circuits inside the computers. I mean, you can't tell the complexity leaps just by looking at gross morphology. Um, and, 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 and so the problem is, uh, I was trying to point out, you're, you're having all these leaps at the molecular level. So the first question I'll ask, um, I quoted, I quoted Dr. Coyne, who said, uh, who wrote the book, Why Evolution is True. He said, in science's pecking order, evolutionary biology lurks somewhere near the bottom, far closer to the pseudoscience of phrenology than to physics. And whether um, that's its intended meaning or not, I'd say I would agree with that on face value. Do you think that evolutionary biology holds a place along with uh, theories like electromagnetic theory and physics? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, definitely. Okay. And I, I totally, I mean, so you know where that quote from Jerry Coyne comes from, right? Of vice in men, and he's criticizing, it was, he was criticizing evolutionary psychology. Right, yeah, was, which, you know, said, you know, this is impossible. fair common. enough. There's, there's a fair, I, I would agree that evolutionary psychology has some significant issues with it, but that's because um, many evolutionary psychologists are sort of wedded to making just so stories, and we don't have quite the resolution of, um, you know, developing our understanding of exactly how, um, you know, it's, it's, there's no fossil record for psychology, for instance, right? Um, there is a fossil record, and of course, there's like a genetic comparison and taxonomy that we can make. And so he's talking about evolutionary psychology, which I would agree that there are problems. I, I also don't think that we have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think that there are some pretty great things from evolutionary psychology that we can learn. Obviously, me from uh, being a, a neuroscientist and very interested in understanding that uh, behavior is a manifestation of the activity of neural circuits and that neural circuits uh, have to come about if, you know, from our model through evolutionary mechanisms, well, of course, I think behavior is going to be evolved to at least some degree. But, you know, sometimes I think evolutionary psychology goes a little bit far. So I think that's kind of what he's talking about. And, and the other part of it, if you read through that essay, and I've, I've read through the essay, so he's talking about the fact that, evolu that evolution just as a whole, unfortunately, ha has to deal with the fact that it's, 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 it's a trying to assess what has happened in the past. And so therefore, our access to information is limited in many ways. We have to deduce a lot of what happened in the past, just as creationists do, right? They're deducing too, aren't they? I mean, like they're, of course, they're making up a lot of stuff um, and ignoring a lot of evidence, but you have to, if, if the goal is what, what happened for the history of life, what happened for um, the history of the earth, we have to just look at the evidence as it is. So, but I, I don't agree that it's at the bottom of the barrel. It's it, like to say that it's like the same as phrenology is totally ludicrous. And there's there's dozens of departments of evolution in in universities all across the world. And and I mean, plenty of, of evolutionary biologists, paleontologists, geologists that study the history of life and history of Earth. And um, yeah, I mean, it. it's just. It's a totally ludicrous thing to say. I know, and no, I don't know why he said you. it. I think it's garbage, like that he said that. And you can quote. No, no I think that. I think he's actually accurate because I've oh. studied physics, and and I mean, if we take it whether that was his intended meeting or not, right? I'm just like he's actually. If you take it face value, that to me that's very accurate. Michelson and Morley had. Uh, okay, that's just your opinion. You understand that. It's your opinion and Jerry Coyne's opinion. And honestly, he puts his foot in his mouth a lot. So, oh, well, thank you for pointing. Okay. Sure. So, we don't need to argue that. No, that's uh, fine. We can talk we, about we, it. Because so, I, I want to go on. Okay. See, the no. thing is, is so. if, if, if this is what I have a problem with, is it's fine that it's imponderable and, and their guesses and we don't know. That's exactly why it doesn't hold up to something like electromagnetism, uh, where you can actually test it. We don't have the modern world without our understanding of. Maxwell's theory, uh, Maxwell's equations, the application, it, it covers 99% of everyday life. If we didn't, uh, you know, at least apply it, if we may not, know, you know, the average electrical engineer probably doesn't know it in all detail, but he, he, he relies on and someone down in the pipeline really understanding it and, and leveraging it. I mean, we wouldn't have the modern day. There are people today that don't believe, I showed a picture of Richard Smalley, totally rejected it. He was 
you know, toward the end of his life. There's no need. There's just no need for it. Um, we have people that are doing science that are making contributions. There's just no need for believing in evolution. It's, it's, it's to me, so, but you can't do that with other sciences. That's why I say it's the bottom. So now let, if I may go on, um, go right ahead. is there anything that would, uh, what would persuade you a miracle happen? Uh, you know, a uh, miracle in the statistical sense, not, not a metaphysical. So like a miracle, you know, like, let's say for example, if I said the sun is exceptional, uh, we might say, quote unquote, miraculous. Mm. And then we have an observation that there's no other sun like it. There's no other star like it in the universe. That is now being confirmed. It has what? stability characteristics. What are, that are you talking about? <laughs> okay. You, you honestly think our sun is 100% unique in the entire universe when our our galaxy alone has 400 billion stars in it and there's probably more galaxies than that and it you think unique. that our it sun is... is the unique star out of i mean do the math quadrillions of stars yes yes and, it is unique okay so what well, I, how I, do you know that how they can had you possibly stuff. say no no, that? Th th no this is a good no this is a good probing question see this is uh, see this? Okay, I know. You, I mean, you I seriously it. like. No, no, I'm, I'm about to explain to you. Stars I'm about to explain to you. Alone. For, for life, for life, for life, it's a very important feature that uh, we have a stable environment. The, okay. the, the sun has unusual stability. Uh, unusual stability where, to where compared is this to other cited? stars. That the sun is absolutely unique amongst all the stars in the entire universe. Can you can you provide that was, that a citation was, was Hugh for Ross. this? Hugh Ross was a professor at okay. Cal, Cal show, Physics. Show me okay. the citation. All right, I think that's no. This is a fair point. I'm going to look. Right. So, I, I, yeah. And and if I if I, I mean, get it, if, if you I go down it, to like down to the molecules, if you count all the molecules in the star, all right. I, I assume no, 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 that, that, that our sun, of course, okay. it's going to be different than probably all, all right. of them because we're talking about you know quadrillions uh, and quadrillions of molecules. But yeah. you know, realistically, the sun all is right. just. A, a regular star it really isn't okay. all that special all right to be fair we we can settle this we don't have to settle it right now okay okay you, you you've requested a citation and this is one thing about the way we're doing this we can we can go back you know we, we don't have to settle it now we can go back there is a book hugh ross has pub published on fine tuning he has the references there i can i can get that book i can look up the references and sure okay just for the uh, sake of the readers right. okay so so, so that, to be that, fair to the and, readers and so you're like, claiming you that my the, word for it the sun is absolutely unique amongst all stars in the entire universe yes okay all right okay. I, i'm looking forward to seeing that citation that that the physical features of our of our sun are is absolutely unique and and that not a single other star even comes close to having those Some physical those features. Characteristics. Obviously, it emits light, but it's it's well, also obviously the optical. yeah. There's lots of stars that release light. We got white dwarfs. You got red right. giants. But it, yes. it has, it's it's optimized in ways that make habitability ha, make habitability possible. So, uh, you so know, I, I this, recognize this evaluation that. So now, in if, the I, of, if I could ask you, okay, but ahead. that really the reason I put that on the table is, is there an observation that would make you believe? A statistical exception, a miracle that so, we're in a special place. If what do you, and, and, what do you mean by if miracle? If I may share this, if uh, before sure. I, let me complete my question. If I may share this, some people said, "Nah, I think I'd look for a naturalistic uh, explanation." So this isn't a criticism, and I'm not saying that. You know, I'm just saying at a personal level or professional level, is there any point where uh, you might say something is a miracle, or would you always look for some sort of explanation that you know you could describe in terms of uh, physics and chemistry. Um, I, I was just curious is, you know, um, no, I, yeah. what do you mean by miracle? What does that mean? Violation of expected outcomes, violations of, uh, I mean, I see violations of expected of outcomes all the time when I set up an experiment and, and I have to reject a hypothesis because uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm seeing something that I just wasn't expecting. All right. So, so like, say, right. is that know, a miracle? The no, it could be that your 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 hypothesis was wrong. Right. Okay. So, but what would count as, 
you know, because we have said that the the normal course of the, the way things happen would be kind of the accepted laws of physics and chemistry. You can put kind of the major laws of physics on a sheet of paper. The, the five major pillars of this, it doesn't cover sure. all of them. Right. And, and, and we're still and waiting for the major synthesis, right? Because gravity you, you can, is still very different from electromagnetism and strong and weak uh, forces. So one, right? could, one could describe violations of these laws that you would you would say now that wouldn't happen like a violation if you you know the basic things in biochemistry we have about three and a half minutes left sure. so you have like the gibbs energy if a reaction goes against the gibbs energy under very precise conditions you'd say that you know uh, either our experiment is wrong or a miracle happened and, and i'm just saying it's like okay that would be a violation of all the laws that we understand and that's starting to happen now in origin of life when they're having to invoke multiple universes because the t statistics don't land up, uh, line up. Now, I'm not saying that they're right, but they're being forced to that. They're saying this is this is so highly improbable, like the RNA word hypothesis, that the only way to rescue it is to have multiple universes. So that's what I mean. But okay. um, if you know, if it's not well defined for you, okay, then you know, I'll just say that I couldn't define it in a way that. You could answer the question, and that's that's totally fair. Someone a creationist sure. like me would would be able to say, "Yeah, this is what I really mean." You may not like the way I approached it, but to me, when it's so complex and it's so improbable, that's enough for me to say it is a statistical miracle at the least, possibly a violation of physics and chemistry. Therefore, I would I would entertain that there is a deity that caused it. Um, that is outside of science, but I think doing the odds calculating or like saying the sun is exceptional is within science to say something's improbable something's unique something's exceptional um it seems i have two minutes left um do you think what do you think about uh <laughs> i don't see how you can think that a potassium ion channel could evolve naturally okay that would be that that looks to me like a faith assumption that it would that it, you could go from first principles of chemistry and even a variety of what you would think plausible. So is that an assumption or do you do you really think you can prove this to, to me or well, the origin of life I, I researchers? Think that's a good point. So and I'm, I'm glad you brought up potassium ion channels because it's something that I know a bit about, right? Because, because that's why I brought it up that. because you know a bit about sure. it and I'm done. That's my last so, question. So yeah, yeah. Uh, you have the floor. So the thing is about the, okay. Um, when you say potassium ion channel, what do you mean? The base features, cause I know there's a variety like the voltage gated and then right. ones with, you know, but it, well, which one are you talking about? How about that bacterial one? Bacterial? I don't know anything about bacterial potassium channels. Okay, and, and that's fair. So, but so I, I do just... know a bit about um, mammalian potassium ion channels. We could talk a little bit about it. In fact, I have a few slides on it. But first, before we do that, I wanted to. So, share... you have the floor now, so you can grill me now. So, sure. Uh, thank you very much for. Yeah, sure. Enter entertaining this format. So, hopefully, you can see this. Um, this is a quote that I sent you, right? Um, from this paper. Uh, the evolution of reverse gyrase suggests a non-hyperthermophilic uh, hy non last common ancestor, right? So this is the issue about like trying to figure out the, um, you know, what is going to be a, a, a challenging issue, right? So I thought that this quote was really great. Understanding the nature of the last common ancestor of extant life, which is often referred to as LUCA, so this would be when you had some sort of replicator. It is one of the most difficult yet important problems in evolutionary biology. I would agree with that, uh, especially the difficult part. If we were able to determine the genes encoded by LUCA, we could make important conclusions regarding the evolutionary histories of all living organisms, as well as make predictions about the environment in which the LUCA lived. However, deciphering phylogenetic relationships dating back billions of years is a process fraught with difficulty. Not least because continual mutation over such time periods saturates sequences, erasing earlier phylogenetic signals that may exist, but also because mechanisms such as horizontal gene transfer 
act to introduce phylogenetic conflict between protein histories, further decreasing our ability to resolve such ancient relationships. Hence, the field of evolutionary biology is one in which is prone to disagreements, even when considering similar data sets. So what do you think about this quote? I think that's exactly why I think evolutionary biology lurks somewhere near the bottom. Because <laughs> of this one thing? It, no, no. I okay. mean, it's illustrative. It's illustrative yeah. because in mathematics, we don't have debates like this. We don't have, we, on the basics, on Maxwell's equations, we don't have, we, we don't have engineers debating what? each other. It's like, there, like in physics, there's all kinds of crazy debates. Not, not for basic stuff. Oh, for, I know, but at, at, at the very basic. theoretical side, I've been to theoretical physics. I, I, yeah, I have but, theoretical but not, physicists not who basic, are friends. They go to fisticuffs, like they will fight. I'm not kidding over stuff like this. But, 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 I, but it's so see, for you to pretend that science is like a done deal, is ridiculous, especially in chemistry or geology or physics. Like there's a reason why scientists continue to do experiments because they're still testing hypotheses and they're still arguing about things. Like it's it's ludicrous. No, I- You're pretending basic, that like it's all figured out and it's not. They're it's, arguing it's, it, all the time. The, you know, most of the time we are just trying to learn what's there. As a student of science, it's like, you apply electromagnetic theory. There's not any question of what we would expect. I mean, look, you have batteries, you have generators. We have expectations of how it's going to, uh, we, we don't have argument that it's going to work like this or that. If we just do this, it's, it, 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 it is so much more solid. And Luca is, if it's at the heart of evolutionary theory and there's arguments, that's not very healthy. If we have a third way of evolution, uh, coming out and saying, you know, uh, that uh, neo-Darwinism is basically destroyed. It's like, okay, this is not healthy for a theory. This would, you know, we wouldn't say that about any of the equations of Maxwell's equations that are, are so important, even though I, it's not no, the most complete so theory. It's, it's a challenging thing to piece together, um, you know, what we estimate is probably about 3 billion years of molecular evolution. I would grant that that's somewhat challenging so because that uh, uh, prior to there being any uh, multicellular organism. So that is a, a significant challenge. I would agree with that. Um, and, and I think that's the, what the point of that entire quote is. So, but the thing about potassium channels mm -hmm. is that there's still a lot that we can draw upon from our knowledge of potassium channels and understanding how it's relationship to evolution. So I kind of want to walk through a few things here. So uh, I think you had um, an example of potassium ion channel in your presentation. This is the po uh, potassium voltage gated ion channel subfamily A member one, also known as KV 1.1. Um, so generally the subfamily A will be like usually one and then there's several members and it'll be 0.1. But this is the thing, as you mentioned, there are other potassium channels. So if we look at um, some of the just big categories, we've got um, you know, standard uh, potassium channels, SK channels, uh, inwardly rectifying potassium channels. And here's the various structures. And you pointed out that they're uh, tetrameric typically. So you have a single subunit that is duplicated four times. And then it sort of makes this unique sort of pore in which potassium can flow when it's open. Um, sometimes they will initiate other processes though. So what is, what is the importance of potassium channels to neuroscience? Well, like uh, neurons will typically keep a, a concentration of uh, potassium relatively high within the cell, and then sodium will be relatively high outside of the cell. And so when an action potential occurs, which is how neurons fire, you're gonna have this change in ion concentration that goes down the, ax uh, the axon very, very quickly. So as an action potential is going along, you're gonna have going along here, you're gonna have uh, this flip that's happening with uh, sodium being high and then potassium on the other side. So you have this change in member potential that changes very, very quickly. And so this is something we can measure. We can measure change in member potential, so we can measure voltage. And an action potential is gonna look like this. It's gonna be a process of, okay, so at rest we have, um, I'm just gonna move this out of the way. Uh, we have extracellular um, space. So the green is the sodium, the, the purple is the potassium. And we've got a potassium channel here and a sodium channel here. So the first thing about an action potential is that sodium channels open up. So that lets in, now we got a porous um, 
you know, th these are voltage sensitive. And so we have this sodium channels opening up, letting in sodium, which then initiates as well an, an opening of the potassium channel that you're talking about so that it gets released to the outside of the cell. And this leads to these changes in membrane potential where eventually we start to reach um, uh, equilibrium again through what's referred to as the sodium potassium pump. So this is like the basics of potassium channels. And so potassium channels, they're very important for mediating action potentials. So here's what, like, uh, if we were measuring action potentials, there would be these very, very fast, um, quick changes happening in membrane potentials so that a, a neuron can then release um, uh, um, uh, neurotransmitter, for instance, right? So um, one thing we can do is we can add in potassium channel activators, which will increase the rate of firing. So we can make neurons more sensitive by increasing sort of sensitivity of potassium channels. We can also make them somewhat less sensitive by adding inhibitors for potassium channels. So now things go down. And then of course, like too many action potentials can lead to things like seizures and not enough. This is associated with things like sort of depression and cognitive disorders and that kind of thing. Um, uh, at least that's the idea where potassium channels might be able to come in as far as um, its pharmaceutical purpose could be concerned. Okay, so this is the thing, right? So there's a bunch of different potassium channels and we have a bunch of different kinds. I mean, we even have potassium channels that have two pores, right? So four transmembrane, transmembrane domain, two pore channels, and there's approximately 15 of these in most mammals. Um, the ones that I'm talking about that are most important for action potentials, these are referred to as voltage, voltage gated. There's calcium dependent uh, potassium channels that are relatively slow. And then there's these, um, that it's called slow, but they're, they're sort of high impact potassium channels. I think, I'm not entirely sure. I don't work on potassium channels, so. Um, but there's a bunch of different kinds, right? So we got, here are these families, KV 1.1, 1.2, Here's the subcellular location where they're found within different neurons. And then there's a bunch of potassium channels. Honestly, we don't actually know where they're located within neurons and where they're even located in the brain. So there's a ton, right? And we got 32 genes in mammals for just the voltage gated ones. And then you add 15 genes and another 15 genes for this, you know, the two poor domain one and the inwardly rectifying ones. So we've got like many dozens of potassium channels. And this is the thing when you start to compare them is that you can start to sort of put together a phylogenetic tree of just the families of potassium channels. So we've got family, you know, so several different families. We got the um, uh, KV one through nine and with the different sub members, right? So KV 1.1 and then 1.2, 1.3. We've got KV 10 over here. Here's the calcium uh, dependent uh, potassium channels. Uh, inwardly rectifying potassium channels. Here's the two poor membrane potassium channels and there's similarities between them. And so one of the ideas is that through time, and if, so this is a phylogenetic tree sort of showing like how potassium channels are sort of related to each other. And if you go back far enough, and obviously this is where it gets theoretical because we're talking about events that are billions of years old and it's a long, long time ago. Um, that you know, there's going to have to be probably some sort of sharing within this phylogenetic tree, right? But this is this is the thing. This is a phylogenetic tree of potassium channels, and every human being, as well as every other mammal, will have all of these potassium channels, right? And that some of them are more closely related to to others, right? You you understand that, right? So like KB one point five and one point eight is similar. Uh, were you, if you're asking me a question, right. if that's a rhetorical question, I won't interrupt, sir. Well, no, no. I mean, you understand, like, so KV, like KV 1.3 and KV 1.2, they're more similar to each other than KV 1.1, right? But yeah, all yes, humans that have, was, that have was all That was in my diagram these. in the debate. I said, this is an orchard. The problem is right, the one the at the root. Right, but the orchard exists in each, each animal. You see, and let me walk through it a little bit. Okay, so here's someone you might recognize. Yes. Yes. You know how to say his name, right? <laughs> Aaron. No, it's Aaron. Jesus Christ. <laughs> so, okay. But all right, this is our model, right? So we have n nested hierarchies. We believe that um, uh, human beings and chimpanzees um, have a, a recent common ancestor. And mm -hmm. I, do you recognize these guys? Uh, one's a mouse and one's a rat, I guess. Yeah, yeah good job. Yeah, so this is the mm -hmm. domestic uh, house mouse. 
and this is the brown rat. So they also have a recent common ancestor. So the thing is, if we want to compare the human KV 2.1 to others, so we just take the human protein for KV 2.1 and we compare it to other animals, um, when we find that if we compare it to chimpanzees, it's identical. But then if we compare it to mouse and rat, well, now we see some differences starting to crop up. And I talked about this in my, uh, my debate, not specifically KV 2.1, but we talked about topoi summary. So this is the thing. So now we have, um, but you can see like, okay, these are pretty similar numbers. And you can always pick a sequence to compare to other animals, right? right. We picked humans. And we're going to, we can compare it to chimps, uh, mice, and rats. So you can also pick, say, mice. So you pick their um, KV 2.1 gene, and you compare it to chimps, humans, and, and rats. And here we see, okay, the mouse and the rat are similar. They're more similar than they are to humans and chimps, but they're not identical. It's pretty similar. We're talking about KV 2.1. So we can do this with other ones, right? So we can pick KV 6.2. You can pick any of them and do this. So humans and chimps have, so the chimp KV 6.2 is 99.1% identical to the human version, whereas the mouse and the rat is 89.2 or 90.1 respectively to the human version. So, but if we do this with the mouse, well, the rat K, KV 6.2 is 97.3% different from the mouse. And then of course, humans and chimps are about 90% different. So we have this pattern here of, of comparisons of this entire phylogenetic tree. Because remember, every mammal has the whole phylogenetic tree, right? So if we compare, but this is the thing, we can compare different receptors to each other. And we can compare the KV 1.1 to KV 1.2. And we see that it's, this is why we have a family. And this is how this phylogenetic tree is made. So if, if we're, we're talking about KV 1.1, obviously it's 100% similar to itself. And we compare it to KV 1.2, it's 75% similar approximately. But then mm -hmm. if we go all the way down to like the KV 6.1 and 6.2, well, now we see that it's like 32 or 28% similar. Are you following me? Yes. yes. Uh, right. Would the term, is the, um, the evolutionary biologist would know this, would the term paralog be correct? Do um, you use that term? Uh, yeah, I, I suppose. I uh, I hope someone else can chime in, and I've got a couple of people chatting because I'm not entirely sure. This okay. isn't what I work on. Y yes, I'm following so, you. Right. And by the way, just to be fair, yeah, I I pointed out this phylogenetic tree for the potassium ion channels. It's on my first yeah, slide. Right. And I but showed I, it. But you've seen it here where I showed it, the ancestral. And I'd like to talk about it because okay. you're talking about it somewhat deceptively because you're saying that like somehow the potassium ion channel should also be descended from the or that that the insulin G, uh, receptor should be there should be a common ancestor between both of them no i didn't say that but um okay so that you I, I said it's an orchard that's exactly the point there's no universal tree everyone is agreeing that there's no universal tree for all the proteins so aaron said there's no effing common ancestor mm -hmm. for the proteins and sure. genes that was my point He's no, so, but that's that the thing. Within point. every given family, of course, we can see a lot of similarities. And so every mammal is going to have the same kind of phylogenetic tree for potassium channels. And then, remember, this is just one sub of the portion of the family. This is just one of the families, right? There's, so, this so does this not include the, the inner, inwardly rectifying channels or the two poor channels, right? right? So, so these, this is the, the tree for the potassium quit? ion channel. Mm hmm this is a tree of the potassium ion channel. This is a tree of the potassium ion channel. Right. And you can find the, just as I said here, right? You can find the differences between, so like if we're comparing the, and remember this is in human, the human KV 6.2 to, uh, to the human KV 6.1 is 100% to 60%. But when you compare the human KV 6.2 to the human KV 1.1 and the 1.2, well, it's around like 30%, right? So, so we're, we're in agreement. This is a tree. Yes. There's a tree within each tree. human being, within each mouse, within each rat. So the, you know, the, the design, did the designer equip groups of animals to have the same phylogenetic tree? Because you believe that mice and humans have a separate creation, right? 6,000 years ago, rodents and humans were, were specially created but they have the same exact phylogenetic tree 
with approximately the same differences, because I can do this same thing of going like comparing the mouse KV 6.2 to the mouse KV 6.1, and it's gonna be the same. Same with chimps. So did, did the designer design it so that would, there would be this phylogenetic tree in each uh, like kind between the, the rodents and the apes, not counting humans obviously, because humans and apes are distinct ancestors of each other. Did you want an answer from me? Um, yeah. I'm okay. curious to hear what you have to say. Under, under the old Earth model, uh, it depends. Under the young Earth model, yes. Young Earth model. So if we have experimental observational evidence that the Earth is young as a matter of principle, it's by common design, not common descent. Mm -hmm. Because they, there's no there won't be enough time to evolve it from a common ancestor. It, as a matter of principle, that would have to be the case. Okay. So you're saying that, okay, humans chimps mice and rats they have they all have the the same sort of basic phylogenetic tree except if we compare say the human kv 6.2 to the chimp we see some differences but then we see even more differences if we compare them to rodents are you saying that the, that the designer equipped rodents with a specially sort of set of kv 6.2 for rodent life is that what you're saying yes okay. absolutely and, and then, under Young Earth model, not under the old Earth creationist. There are two right. creationists. Sure. Okay, okay so, so under the Young Earth model, right? Because so, so older I, creationists I teach, would say... I, okay, just to be fair, I right. teach both because a lot of the people that watch, that listen to me are old Earth creationists and I respect them. Right. I tell them I'm a Young Earth creationist. We can disagree on the details. But if the Earth is young, it would have to be this. Okay. So, as, as you said, it would have to, it would have, it is, it, it would be... It would be a conclusion based on the premise of young Earth. It's not something um, you would even need to uh, do much debate about if you can show the Earth is young. Okay. And okay, so thank you. So right, uh, and I, I mean, would you agree that if the Earth is young, this this would have to be a common design, not right? You would say okay. that, like, okay, the fam the family of potassium ion channels is 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 the, optimally the suited design. for rodent life right? right like for for their lifestyle right and that the you know say primates and chimpanzees that the the family of uh potassium ion channels as well as the rest of their genetics is optimal for like primate life uh, right it may be optimal may, it what may does that be mean? optimal but i'm just pointing out would you agree if the earth is young if 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 say, you know, say less than 10,000 years, this could not be the result of evolution. This would have to be either some miraculous coincidence or a design. It, it could not have been the result of I common ancestry. I don't know if I, I, could, I could agree with that. I think that if we found that the earth was young, that okay. um, that somehow it was 6,000 years old instead of on the order of hundreds of millions or billions, I'd be shocked to find out if that's indeed the case. Okay. Um, given all the evidence that we have of a very old Earth. Um, but if we were happen to find that out, um, I know I wouldn't necessarily think that we need to invoke miracles to explain this. But I hear in your model that there is a designer and you believe it was, I mean, you, you've said it was Jesus that did this, right? Um, yes. Right, yes. And it yes. Um, not the Holy Ghost, right? It was Jesus who, are, they're the same, aren't they? Uh, the, the triune God right. in the verse in question. I mean, it's in the New Testament. Uh, he he made all things. It was referring to the logos, sure. which is Jesus. Okay. So there are theological arguments. Did they split that, it up? But, like, did Jesus take the rodents and Holy Ghost do the primates? And the, uh, the way that I read the New Testament, Jesus is the Creator. Okay. okay. Uh, and and there's there's trinitarian theology about this god the father god the son god the holy spirit right. and the verses same. in the bible that say sure. you know when we baptize someone into the christian faith we say i baptize you in the name of the father the I son see. and the holy spirit so the idea is three persons in one you know god is uh in three persons and so but okay. i mean thank you for so, asking sure sure yeah. i just just to clarify so um we i, sh I we talked about this when we talked about uh um the model organisms part right because you were saying that model organisms are specially suited for um uh 
you know, um, discovery for human beings. And that's why the designer did these things. But I that's wanted to one revisit of, that's one. Of, that's one of the yeah, that's one of the design sure. criteria. Right. It's, it's not so, the only one I, I, I want, should have added. Yeah. And this has been long before me that the designer created this. A man might wonder uh, at his creator. That was from a PBS evolutionary series. Right. That's not from. That was the conclusion they made in the I PBS see. evolution series. So you're this saying made, that like for 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 rodents and remember rodents yeah. um, are relatively large. We got a bunch of different rodents. We've got squirrels and porcupines yeah. and and gophers. But the the thing that's really striking about the rodents is there's this small group called the myomorpha, uh, which uh, contains 1,524 different species of mouse-like rodents. So we've got mice, rats, gerbils, hamsters, lemmings, and voles that are in this group. So, and then here's a phylogenetic tree showing some of them. So I wanted to kind of go through this a little bit. So rodents, right, you said that they have this lifestyle of living like a rodent. And we have, um, you know, we've got a bunch of different kinds of rodents, right? So here's the house mouse. Mm -hmm. And we got the gerbil here. This is the Mongolian, no, Mongolian hamster. There's this weird guy, um, uh, Jaculus Jaculus from Egypt, um, but all rodents, um, uh, that, that these guys are rodents. So this is a rodent, this is a rodent, this is a rodent. They have a rodent lifestyle, right? And, you know, there are things that are also similar, like we've got different kinds of moles. So they have relatively small eyes and they've got these claws that they use to dig in the ground. Some of them are interesting and unique. So there's, there's actually a ton of interesting neuroscience about this guy, the star nose mole. Um, you know, very interesting little guy, but moles are moles, right? So they have their rodent life. They have a mole lifestyle. They probably have genetics that's specific to, to mole lifestyle. And we have carnivores, which I know uh, Aaron had talked about the different carnivores, you know, bears and wolves and dogs, right? So they have their own sort of specific lifestyle. And presumably they're going to have their own genetics that's specific to this. So if we go back to this, right, we talked about rodents being very, very similar. And if we wanted to look at KB... Um, genes, the potassium ion genes in this group, let's take a look, right? We got rodents doing rodent lifestyle type things, right? These animals, all these animals on the screen, they live like rodents, they're, they're doing rodent stuff. So if we compare KV 1.1 of the mouse, so this guy, to the others, of course, the mouse is going to be 100% identical because it's, mm -hmm. it's the same. So if we compare it to the others, what we find is that these guys actually have really high uh, homology. So the, the, the percent similarity is very, very high. You know, so this guy, 99.4, 99.8, you can see they're very, very similar. So KV 1.1 is a, a, a potassium ion channel that's highly uh, um, uh, retained and doesn't undergo a whole lot of change. Um, we compare it to humans, we have 98.4. But when we compare it to these guys, we have 95.4 which is weird, even though they're very rodent-ish. And if we do this for KV 2.1, mouse is 100%, of course. And if we do this for the other ones, now KV 2.1 is not nearly as well retained. Now we're talking about 96, 97% similarity across these different rodents. And we compare it to humans, so the mouse to the KV, the KV 2.1 mouse to the human uh, KV 2.1 is 93.7. But then when we compare it to these rodent-like guys, we have 85 and 84.8. Very similar, but obviously less than humans? That seems weird if they're rodent living, living rodent lifestyles. If we do this for KV 6.2, the mouse compared to all these other guys, we get somewhere about 94, 93%. Rats and mice generally tend to be very similar. When we compare the mouse to humans, it's 90.5. And now when we compare it to these guys, we're now we're talking about 70% or even um, closer to 60%. Do you have any idea why this might be? In the 10,000 year model, I did, and, and this is a good point you made, I need to amend what I said earlier. Not in the present day, it's not all, what we have is not necessarily what was in the original creation. There had been mutations uh, the these rodents have high reproduction rates. They can they can introduce mutations from the original form. Plus, we have alleles. Uh, sure. The creationist model is that the alleles but were these created. Are, these are the same genes, right? It's KV six point two. We're comparing the mouse well, KV six point two to yeah. this guy, which is the deer mouse. Oh, and, it, 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 and, and even 
I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but if we have alleles at the same gene locus, they're going to, if they began differently, they, there will even be differences among the alleles. You can't score them at 100%. So, um, but there's then, a, you're yeah. seeing a consistent pattern here of these rodent like creatures having very low um, similarity in their in these, you know, the potassium ion uh, channel genes, l less than humans. You don't see something odd here? Oh, definitely. And that's okay. very interesting because, um, you know, we don't know if that's a separate creation or if it has a high mutation rate. I personally don't care um, if we have evidence that it's young, then these are independent creations. But the point of creationism, whether it's old earth or young earth, that there had to be a miracle along the way. And that's at the root of the orchard. You're focusing on the mm. branches. I focused sure. at the roots. Of but the it tells orchard. us a lot about the history. And if you're saying that animals have genes, mm. they're specially suited for their lifestyle. There's something I, I'm very not, interesting. I'm not, I'm not arguing that generally that maybe you did you did argue that and now you're backing off but that's okay so let's continue I'm not, on i'm not saying so generally the thing is, I, so I'm not, so okay, the, i'm not saying absolutely right so the I'm thing about this is that these guys are actually uh they're they're marsupials that happen to live rodent-like lifestyles and so the the I, marsupial genome is sequenced um this was the first there's only a few of them that have been sequenced and so most marsupials don't really look much like rodents, right? So we have these guys, uh, which are the, um, the Tasmanian devil. Um, this is the bushtail um, opossum. This is the wombat. You can see how giant this thing is. And this is the koala, which we all know and love. The koala is very sweet and lovely. Um, except don't, don't actually pick them up because I think that they'll tear your eyes out. Um, so here's the thing about this guy, this one that the one that we're talking about. So this is the gray short tailed opossum. It is technically an opossum, but it actually lives very, very much like a rodent. Um, when we compare the KV 1.1 gene to marsupial genomes, so here's five marsupials. What we can see is that the KV 1.1 gene of this little tiny rodent like marsupial is basically 99% similar to a wombat, this giant beast of a thing, a koala, uh, a, the Tasmanian devil, and the bushtail possum. But when we compare the little tiny gray short tailed opossum to other animals, such as humans or the house mouse, I mean, look, they're almost identical. The vole, the, um, the golden spiny mouse, the brown rat, the, the gerboa, the deer mouse, and the Mongolian hamster, now we see that this separate group of placental mammals is 95% similar uh, when we talked about the KV 1.1 gene. So it looks like this tiny little rodent-like little creature actually has a very much, very similar to, it's much more similar genetically to this thing, to this thing, to this thing, and this thing than it is to these rodents. Um, so the other thing is that we can do this for all of the potassium ion channels, right? We can do KV 2.1. So we compare KV 2.1 of the gray short-tailed opossum to the wombat, the koala, the, uh, the colocolo, colocolo opossum, the Tasmanian devil, and the bushtail opossum. We see that it's all above 90%. And when we compare the same genome, the same gene to all of these little rodents, even though they're identical in their basic lifestyle and overall shape and even almost their anatomy to a very large degree, instead, they all have genes that are, um, that are very different than, um, than this guy. So this, again, this little tiny rodent-like creature is more genetically similar to this, 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 and this than it is to this, 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 and this. And you can go through the entire genome and do this over and over and over again. Now, of course, it's an opossum, so that seems a little unfair. Well, you know, like I said, we don't have too many marsupial genomes. Uh, we only have some genes from many marsupials, and one of which is the yellow-footed marsupial mouse, right? So this is like a mouse, <clears throat> except that it's a marsupial. And you can see that if we compare the NADH dehydrogenase subunit 5 sequence to the wombat, or the, again, the short-tailed opossum, 
or the Tasmanian devil, we can see that it's all around 80% similar. Whereas if we compare this little guy if for this gene to humans, dogs, and then also mouse, voles, rats, the jerboa, the mouse, the deer mouse, and the, the Mongolian hamster, they're all about 65%. And you can do this over and over and over again. You're gonna find that its genetics is much more similar to um, the uh, to other marsupials that look incredibly different than you will to animals that look almost identical to it. And we can, so yeah, here's all of these other animals. You can see they're basically look almost identical. I mean, you, you could, I would forgive someone for thinking that this is a like an actual like house mouse because it looks almost the same, except that its genetics is much more similar to a koala or the Tasmanian devil than anything else. We can do this for, I can go on and on. So we can go about adrenergic receptors. So adrenergic receptors, there's a bunch, there's a family here. Um, they are sensitive to adrenaline and noradrenaline, and they induce all kinds of changes within cells. Very complex, super complex. And you can see that it's a family of adrenergic receptors. And I showed you this, right? We had moles. So here's all the different moles. But the thing I didn't tell you is that one of these moles is a marsupial. And if you compare this adrenergic receptor of the southern marsupial mole to all of these other moles, you can see that its genetic similarity is in on the order of around 70%. But when you compare its genetics, this alpha 2b adrenergic receptor to a wombat, a koala, the opossum, or the Tasmanian devil, you can see that it's more than 90%. It's almost 95% for all of them. So this is a mole with mole morphology, yet its genetics hardly looks anything like a mole. And there has to be some sort of explanation for this, right? If they have a toolkit that's more marsupial than it is mole. And we can, the thing about this is that we know that Australia separated from continents many, many, many millions of years ago. So if we can track, you can go back in time, we can monitor this. So you can see Australia is moving away from the continents and it was basically completely isolated for almost 150 million years ago. And it was populated by marsupials and no placental mammals. And so that allowed for this rudimentary marsupial animal to occupy various niches. So they were under selection pressure to diverge and take over things that say, what mice do or what climbing animals do, even gliding. There's, there's gliding marsupial animals versus like flying squirrels. Tasmanian tigers versus bobcats, Tasmanian wolf versus the wolf. The, here's the marsupial mole versus all the other regular moles. You can find that there's these basic similar niches and similar sort of selection pressures are gonna drive animals to have this kind of change, right? I mean, it's inevitable. So, um, you know, so if we go through, again, now that I kind of revealed everything here, we can look at carnivores. And so the one thing I didn't tell you is that we have two marsupials on here. So we have this, which is the Tasmanian wolf. And then of course, this is the Tasmanian devil. And when we compare the Tasmanian wolf cytochrome B sequence to the bush-tailed opossum, to the Tasmanian devil, to the short-tailed opossum, or even the mole, okay, like this does not look like this. You can see it's about 90% similar, but when we compare it to, you know, other carnivores like dogs, wolves, bears, foxes, now it's on the order of about 80%. And you can throw in humans and mouse, mice in here. I mean, you can see it's even, it's more similar to a house mouse than it is a fox. <clears throat> so, I mean, how is this, how, what is the creationist explanation for, for this? Uh, first off, I need uh, if that if you're directing the question at me, I'd first like to address something that you said I backed up on, and I need to clarify that I cited specifically, and I have the article here, Proceedings National Academy of Sciences, J.C. Phillips. I referred to it. I didn't have the citation at the time when I had thrown this out, where I suggested there's optimization for hydropathic. So it's the self-organized networks Darwinian evolution of Diane and Ring stocks and stock heads. And he suggested this is evidence of intelligent design. He got flack for it. I don't totally agree with his article, but he was suggesting there is some level of um, optimization. I wouldn't say absolute for the variations. Now I had pointed out that natural selection is failing as a paradigm. You can't invoke 
This is an inference that is adapted to its environment because of natural selection. It's failed. I'm not the first one to say this. This is why this third way of evolution is coming out. And some of the stuff that's coming out sounds very much creationist. So what? I had said, if it is, if the earth is less than 10,000 years, then a lot of these difference had to be created or it's the result of mutation thereafter. We don't know. Uh, and even you, you, yourself said, you yourself said, we don't know a lot. And it is kind of troubling that, for example, we know a lot. I would not say that we don't front, know a lot. Uh, let me point out something. Okay. I, I, I'd appreciate <laughs> that's not it. what I said. Okay. If, if introns in Aerodopsis thaliana are more similar to humans than, than uh, animals like um, that were pointed out in a paper, other animals, Okay. This is not good for this is not no. good for evolutionary theory that the introns in a plant are more similar to a human than other animals. Okay. I I'm totally that. unaware of this article. Okay, I'll if give you it share to you. it with me, that would be great. But okay. even then, I, I, does, I, I what can, does that I mean then, Sal? The, are you, you saying that the, the if, are you saying that Jesus made Ariadopsis with introns to be similar to humans? Is that okay, what you're saying? I'll, that first the creator off, I'll give this? you. I'll, and why would I'm the creator do up, that, Sal? Okay, I'm I'm looking look. I'm going to look up I'm the citation. I'm curious to hear about this. I'm going to look Does up the, the citation. Does the citation talk about the mechanism by which Jesus made Aerodopsis introns to look like humans? Because you have to have that part of your model, then, right? Like, if you want me to explain it, you also have to explain it. You you can't just point out like, oh, well, here's a problem. You don't. You can't explain. You know the origin of potassium channel. Well, I happen to have I happen to ago. have an email from and, you that you said that I could share. Yeah. Publicly, I said if it's young, you said you agreed that a, a lot of this would have to be created. I, okay. Why don't I? I don't agree with that. that. Huh? I don't agree with that. Uh, okay, I'll look up the email. If I, All right. if I, I mean, if, if I, I conflict with whatever I said in the email, fine. But okay. just because if like you know, the. You agree that that you your premise is that Jesus made what on the order of about six thousand years ago the rodents uh, more like I, I like six thousand five hundred six thousand five hundred okay we'll add an extra five hundred years because that hey that makes a big difference we're talking about ten percent more time for um, for all of this to occur so I I think an extra five hundred years is important so so Jesus did by, all by, this by a miracle by a miracle ago. a special creation sure not but natural it quickly, process. Right. And, and you're saying, so if we go back to, uh, you know, this phylogenetic tree, doo, 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 sorry, here we are, that you agree that Jesus did not make all 1,524 species on creation day, right? Of, of the myomorphs. You believe that know. some of these evolved. Maybe. What do you mean? Maybe I don't have to what account for everything. Say? If if I don't have to, if if evolutionists don't have to account for every root of the orchard, why are you why are you asking me all these questions? I no, I have, think that I, it's important I, to account for the root of the orchard. Thousands, there could be hundreds of protein families you can't account for. You believe it sure. evolved naturally, and you're yet you're demanding this is not this. You're not applying the same standard to your beliefs sure. as you are to I, mine. That, I totally disagree with that. We have various models of explaining like the evolution of protein uh -oh. families. We can talk about you know the evolution of the various protein uh, channels um, going quite a bit. And in fact, if you look up, and I encourage anyone to do this, anyone who's watching this, go ahead and look up potassium ion channel evolution. You can find hundreds of articles. Of course, it's gonna be largely speculative to some degree because we're talking about events that were billions of years old. And I would agree that that's also gonna be the part that's gonna be you know, the most tenuous. But this kind of thing is not tenuous, right? That we have animals it's, it's, that right. have- That's not tenuous. Mm -hmm. right. By the way, uh, the, the quote is, that I talked about introns, remarkable interkingdom conservation of intron positions and massive lineage specific intron loss and gain in eukaryotic evolution. Okay. And, and so, um, Paradoxically, humans share many more introns with the plant Arabidopsis thaliana than with the fly or nematode. So it's it's there. I know this because I studied under one of the yeah. co-authors. Well, if you can okay, share so the link that, with me, I would me, be that curious is, to see that. That is more problematic. But why is that problematic? We have similarities that are crossing kingdoms okay. like this. 
So I, I would say, I would say it's like, how did that happen? You'll, you guys will say, I don't know. We can guess. That's not a model. That's that's. I mean, it is a model, but it is faith acceptance. Mm -hmm. Th that there's some mechanism that can explain it that is naturalistic, and that's fine. Right. But let's not represent it as some sort of empirical proof, like you have for electromagnetism. Okay, so you don't have any explanation for this? No, okay. except a miracle. Only a miracle. A miracle. Miracles is are not why subject to direct. These animals I mean, that's have the thing. Miracles that are, are not subject to, to explanations. That's why they're. That's miracles. your explanation. This isn't science. This is this is why I started off my debate because I knew, like, of course, it's a miracle. I started off my debate that this is not a debate about science. This is a debate about theology, and it really is. Well, my point it's is because it's not about science. I, I, well, it totally the point is, is, I, is we're talking about a lot is, about science topics, right. but it's and about saying, theology. You, right, it's a mir you're going to invoke miracles to explain right. why marsupials have similar genomes to each other and not to the analogs that we find of like rodents that are placentals or moles that are placentals or mm. carnivores that are placentals. Miracles. Yes. These are all miracles. Oh. So they're all similar so, to each other. Chris, Chris, uh -huh. Chris, I I'm sorry to. Okay. I have a meeting at, no at 9.30. We can commute. Uh, I should geez. have. It's 9.30 right now. I can let you yeah, go. I, I should, I should have out of courtesy to you, let you know I may have That's fine. something like, if I can just check to see if they want me like right now, it's okay. all right. I mean, so, we can so, end. It's, uh, we've gone an hour and a half, but, and that's yeah. uh, quite some and time. You're actually like 40 minutes. I did 40 minutes. Yes, we actually true. hit our target. I did want to say, I think evolution is theology pretending to be science. Okay. That was my point. Good this was all about theology. Evolutionism <laughs> is, is not theology, science. It's, okay. it's faithfully pretending to be science. There are books. There's a book that said Darwinism as religion. That's the point I was making. All right. Good luck. Sounds good, Sal. Well, well thank by you the way, for joining can, can us. We, uh, how can I get a hold? Can you email me uh, the link to this? Uh, sure. Group? Happy to and, email the link. And I'd like to rebroadcast yep. it. Um, yep. Sure. That's fine. I just want to thank you. The, yep. There were some very good points on potassium ion channels. It was beautiful to see your neuroscience. Great. I mean, that's not my I would love studying that's... neuroscience under you because I think neuroscience is real science, unlike evolutionary theory. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. A little drive-by at the end. Sounds good, Sal. Uh, thank, thank you for your time. And thank you for accepting the format. I very much appreciate it. Yeah, it's been Alrighty. fun. Take care. Adios. Adios. All righty. Well, I am here. And I'm looking through some of the chat. Um, and I do not know how to set that up so i'm going to be looking here i gotta figure this out i don't know how to do this with obs so i'm really sorry but i'm gonna look through some of this just to see who's here i see speed is here which is good hopefully you can go back to when you came in to see this i know you told me not to uh um right so but that's okay i see sexy find.xyz is in here that's fun um Well, yes, he had to go. That's fine. He had a meeting. Um, I, I can't say that he had to run just because. And I know he actually streams often very late and does things late, so it easily could just be that. Um, yeah. So anyway, that was fun. Um, uh, yeah, put a, a fair amount of work into that, um, and I hope to use it again. But uh, unfortunately, the cat's out of the bag, and uh, um, so anyway, thanks for coming, everybody. Hopefully, you got something out of this. And I just to reiterate, and I think I, I should do this again anyway, just to talk about this one more time. All right. So what I was trying to point out is that creationists believe that that animals that are similar to each other um, are gonna have similar genetics. It's the reason why the rodents all have similar genetics and they're gonna say, well, they have similar genetics. They might say, okay, well, because they have been rapidly evolving and so obviously like the deer mouse and the house mouse, well, maybe there was a common ancestor between them and they speciated over time, right? That's one thing that they might say. 
and maybe the brown rat is in there too but they were all specially created from a group and therefore the reason why their genetics are so similar is because they got to live rodent lifestyles and that carnivores are going to have carnivore lifestyles and and the marine mammals are going to have marine mammal lifestyles and birds have bird lifestyles um but the thing is the convergent evolution with the marsupials and the placentals completely blow this out of the water because when you compare the marsupial here to these guys you can see that they're virtually identical yet the genetics of the southern marsupial mole is almost exactly the same i mean i don't want to say exactly the same it's much much more similar to a koala a kangaroo an opossum than it is to any of these moles the genetics of this guy the the monodelphus domestica is much more similar to a koala to a kangaroo to the marsupial mole than it is to the deer mouse or the house mouse or the rat or the mongolian hamster um, all of these are much more similar to each other because they're placental mammals and they had a more recent common ancestor whereas this obviously diverged a long time ago and through convergent evolution and similar sort of natural selection pressures because australia is not that different than um, than the other continents. It's going to have insects and other things going on, and it's got different kinds of habitats. And so there's going to be selection pressure for uh, animals to sort of end up having to do the same thing. So they're going to end up, uh, you know, following along an evolutionary path that's going to be similar. And, and there's going to be similar pressures that's going to drive different lineages to adopt similar features. Yet, when they do this, the genetics is not going to be identical it's not like all of a sudden they have um uh you know mouse genetics they instead are going to have still marsupial genetics and they're going to find through natural selection random mutation and natural selection they're going to be optimized for um and and alter their overall uh development their overall morphology behavior similar pressures creating similar behaviors and similar patterns of change in their morphology yet the genes are going to be different because they cannot possibly be the same it would be the same if you think a designer did this if you thought a designer was needed you know like if this uh little opossum here needed the you know um the kinds of genes that make the deer mouse the deer mouse why not just give it deer mouse genes right no instead it has marsupial genes and we can do this for all of these. And when we compare the KV 1.1 potassium ion chain of the short-tailed opossum to the wombat, to the koala, to the colo-colo opossum, to the Tasmanian devil, to the bush-tail opossum, we see that that's much more similar than it is to humans, to, and then also all of these other rodents. All of these rodents have genes that are very, very different. Um, yes, I know. So Nestling is pointing out that one in the bottom right is not a rodent. Let me just say here that my title is fair. I said rodents look very similar. I didn't say every single image on this slide is a rodent. I didn't say that. And then technically this is an opossum too. And no, right, no uh, marsupials are rodents. Rodent is, a, uh, is part of the Eutherian clade, Rodentia. And the myomorphs, which is, that's what all of these are. These are myomorphs. They're part of the Rodentia clade. So I reserve the right to have fooled Sal the way that I did. <laughs> so, yes, that's how I feel about that. Anyway, um... So let me say I'm going to finish up. I was kind of hoping we'd go on for a little longer, but he had to run. Um, but that that was the main point that I was going to drive home. But also that, um, and I, I suppose I should go back to the, um, you know, the KV1.1 family is, uh, sorry, the, K, the potassium channel family is very diverse and that it exists in every single animal. And what we know is that obviously this 
this phylogenetic tree suggests that there's been gene duplication over time. And for Sal to claim that, that you know, there's only removal of genes is totally ludicrous because we know of plenty of examples in which gene duplication occurs over and over again. In fact, the animal that I work with, this is what I was going to show. Um, do, 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 here we are. Um, so I work with Xenopus lavis. Um, and here's an article published in Nature, Genome Evolution in the Allotetraploid Frog Xenopus lavis. So the thing about Xenopus lavis is that it has um, around 30 chromosomes. And then it's it's got a, a similar sort of species that's very closely related called Xenopus tropicalis. I think that they refer to that in here, um, right here. Um, and the Xenopus tropicalis has almost half of the number of chromosomes, yet they're very similar when you do the phylogenetic analysis of this. And this is because what we know is that the that Xenopus lavis must have undergone genome duplication. And so this paper nicely covers um, those that genome duplication. So this is showing the Xenopus tropicalis gene to one set of the Xenopus lavis genome to the other set. So Xenopus lavis has chromosomes that are that are referred to as 1L because one is slightly longer and then 1S, which is slightly shorter. For a long time, it was thought, oh, well, these ones are shorter because they're being sort of repressed. It turns out that you can get gene expression of, of uh, genes across all four sets of chromosomes. And so you can get massive gene duplication where now instead of having two alleles to work with, and now instead you actually have four alleles to work with. And so you can get duplication of entire gene families through this process of genome duplication. We know that it's happened in vertebrates a few times at least. And so, yeah, that's how I feel about that. All right. Um, so, yeah, and then the quote mining. I, he'll probably send it to me. He's pretty good for sending citations. But I, you know, I'd ask for the citation. He probably will. So, and he'll see this and that'll be that. So... Uh, yeah, the one on the bottom right was a, a, a Manito del Monte. Yes, that is correct. Uh, let me bring that back up. It is, and it's an opossum. Uh, we also have a genome for it. So both of these, interestingly, these guys are, are both New World marsupials. Um, and they're very tiny and they're very cute. So... Anyway, I think I'm done. I need to go to bed. I spent like all day working on this. Uh, and I had other stuff I had to do too, <laughs> but oh well. So uh, thanks for coming. I really appreciate people coming in here and chatting. Um, I plan on also breaking these, um, these conversations apart and going over them and just creating separate videos. So if you've seen this um, as the live stream, okay, I'm gonna add additional commentary and other things. Um, I have another one um, that'll be coming out. I had a conversation with Sal, but it, it didn't stream very well, so I had to download that. And that one was on ancient genomes and genetic, genetic entropy. And that had just as many uh, surprises as this one, so. Uh, oh, okay. So Manito is a marsupial, but not an opossum. Okay. I, I, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, thank you for correcting that. Um, monkey for banana. Uh, I don't work with marsupials. I don't work with mammals. I work with frogs, right? Um, so I, I had to do a lot of reading about marsupials and placentals this, uh, uh, this afternoon. So, all righty. Thanks for coming and we will check you guys later.